Good evening. My name is Martin Ludden. I'm the executive director of the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and I would like to welcome you virtually to our studios. We're here tonight to talk about the 2020 election with representatives from the League of Women Voters and Minnesota Voice. For those of you following along on Facebook or from your living room, please feel free to chime in and ask questions. Thanks for coming and participating. We hope to see you back here in person in the studio sometime soon. And I would like to introduce Claudia Dieter, a board member with the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. Claudia, welcome. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for your welcome and your kind words. Welcome to 2020 Elections, Protected or Infected. This program is sponsored by the League of Women Voters St. Paul and hosted by SPNN. We hope to bring you information on how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting voting and elections in Minnesota. Again, my name is Claudia Dieter. I'm the chair of the program committee for the League, which has been a member of the St. Paul community since 1919. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to informed and active participation of citizens in government. We neither support nor oppose candidates or political parties. You may be most familiar with the League by our voter registration activities and the candidate forums that we host. We also work to inform or educate the public on issues that may impact them through events like this. Programs this past year included the cash bail system, housing issues, the presidential nominating primary, and cyber security and elections. We were set to present a formal debate on the National Popular Vote Compact with the McAllister College Forensic Debate Team in April. For obvious reasons, that was canceled. Hopefully we can get that back on the schedule. Tonight is a new experience for us. While we have worked with SPNN in the past to present and distribute our programs, it has always been with the studio audience. With the pandemic and the concern for public health, this evening's discussion will be totally virtual. Because this is a new experience, there may be some hiccups. Please bear with us as we learn. You will be able to submit your questions via our Facebook page. If you are watching on the Facebook live stream, you can submit your questions in the comment section. If you are watching on TV, you will need to go to the League, League of Women Voters St. Paul Facebook page. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. Before introducing the speakers, I would like again to thank SPNN for this service to the community and specifically for once again hosting a program with us. They have been a great partner in the past and I'm sure that we will continue to work together in the future. Additionally, I would like to thank the other neighborhood network stations that are live cable streaming this program. We truly appreciate it. Tonight's program, a discussion of the impact of the pandemic on the legislative session and the 2020 elections will be presented by Nick Harper and Joelle Stangler. We have asked them to address legislation that was introduced regarding voting and, ele and elections and how the pandemic impacted the focus of the session. And also how the legislation that was passed will impact the elections and voting. Nick Harper, a licensed attorney, is the League of Women Voter Minnesota's Civic Engagement Director. In this capacity, Nick assists the local leagues in providing voter services and serves as a staff lead for state advocacy. His interests cover all aspects of political activity and civil, civic engagement, including legislative process, money and politics, voting rights, redistricting, and other election law. Joelle Stangler is also a civic engagement director. She is with the organization Minnesota Voice. Minnesota Voice is a coalition of nonprofit organizations working for permanent change in racial, social, and economic issues by increasing civic engagement and voter participation, especially focused on underrepresented communities. Um, as an aside, Joelle deserves a special shout out for filling in at the last minute for a coworker who has been recently exposed to the COVID-19 virus. And with that, let's get started. Go ahead, Nick and Joelle. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, we are going to um, start with our questions. Beatrice from the local uh, League of Women Voters of St. Paul is gonna prompt up with some initial questions to get us started. Great, thanks. What legislation passed during the regular legislative session to address elections and COVID-19? Right, so uh, there was a lot of discussion um, when the pandemic was 
starting about what needed to be done in order to protect the, the uh, primary election in August, and then also, of course, the November election, um, given that it's uh, a presidential primary year. Um, so we, uh, a lot of organizations were uh, focused on figuring out um, what needed to be done. Um, the Secretary of State's office worked with local election officials, as well as the League, um, as well as um, uh, Minnesota Voice and lots of other organizations to figure out how to serve voters um, and uh, keep the elections running without, with the pandemic happening. Um, there was some compromise legislation that was finally passed. Uh, there was a couple of key pieces. Uh, one piece was uh, funding to make sure the work can get done. Uh, so the federal government, through the Help Americans Vote Act, um, or the HAVA Act, uh, provided funding from the federal government. The state legislature had to approve that. There was $14.3 million total. Um, and then in addition to that, the state matched it with an additional three million, about $3 million of funding. So that, was, um, that funding was approved to go to the Secretary of State's office and then distributed to local election offices. Um, Local election offices were also authorized to take um, candidate filings electronically. In Minnesota, you're required to prov uh, uh, provide your candidate filing in person, uh, but they changed it so that this year candidates can file electronically. They also uh, made it, um, we found out that there were some polling places that uh, are in residential facilities where uh, th the residents are vulnerable to COVID-19. Um, so some senior housing facilities, for example. So uh, a lot of local election officials said that we needed to have the ability to change our polling places. Usually they have to be frozen earlier in the year, um, in January or February, or perhaps the end of the year before. Um, but they requested the ability to change some of those locations. Um, so their, their last year to do that is um, July 1st, actually. Um, so some local um, governments will have the ability to change their polling place locations if necessary. Um, one of the compromise provisions that came out of the Senate was that um, polling places uh, also cannot be in schools unless that's the last resort. Um, so trying to keep polling places out of schools, which are a common location, um, you can still use them if you have to, but preferably keep it out of there. Um, and um, uh, one piece that I know the League was fighting for, I think Minnesota Force was fighting for, um, was um, trying to get um, mail voting um, for the 2020 election. We already have no excuse absentee voting. What that means is you can vote by mail absentee if you request your ballot to be sent to you. Um, uh, mail voting, you, which some small townships in, in greater Minnesota already do, um, you automatically receive your ballot. When you register to vote, that is you essentially are saying, I would like to receive my ballot by mail automatically. Um, and then when election season comes around, you, ought, you get your ballot in the mail, you return it. You don't have to actively request it for every election. Um, why that's important is because um, we're already thinking that there's going to be a lot of um, shortage um, and a lot of difficulty keeping up with the amount of absentee ballots and amount of absentee ballot requests. And if you can simplify that process by simply taking the request form out of the, out of the, the system and just automatically sending people ballots um, if you're registered to vote, that simplifies the system. That removes a lot of um, administrative overhead. Um, I think local election officials were estimating that that's about one-fifth of the work that they do when there's an absentee ballot request. Um, so we were hoping to get that overhead removed. Unfortunately, they're not, there wasn't agreement from the Senate um, on that provision. I think I got everything. Okay. Joelle, did I miss anything? That was great. Okay. Very thorough. <laughs> Excellent. And for you, Joelle, can you provide more context about what's happening in other states and what that means for Minnesota? Yes, absolutely. This has been a really big year for voting in our country, particularly in the context of the COVID um, crisis, but also in the context of the civil unrest and the uprisings that started right here in Minnesota. Um, but we know that voting is not just a fight that happens in the middle of crisis. It's a decades-long fight. It's a deeply partisan fight um, with a long history. 
And so what we're seeing is an election year where um, voting is becoming increasingly a point of partisan contention and a battleground um, for political power. So what we saw earlier this year um, during the presidential primary election was states either opting into changing their elections or refusing to change their elections um, because of the pandemic. And so we had 16 states postpone their primary elections, but many of them forged ahead. And what happened was people didn't show up as poll workers because they were afraid of contracting the virus. You had long lines at polling locations because they either couldn't open up or folks um, weren't able to social distance appropriately um, or have their station sanitized. And what it led to was a decrease in engagement in the election, which equals um, a lack of trust that folks have in the process and their elected leadership. So that was a really big moment that happened earlier this spring. Um, and what we've seen since then is the fight to expand voting rights and to make sure that folks can safely vote in the upcoming election become an incredibly partisan fight. Um, what we do know is that the vast majority of Americans support increasing people's access in the middle of the COVID crisis. Here in Minnesota, we know that 59% of people in a very recent poll put out just a couple weeks ago by the Star Tribune said that they support every single person getting mailed a ballot. So we have widespread public support for people getting sent a ballot um, and being able to vote in the easiest way possible in a way that 25% of Minnesotans already vote. In 2018, 25% of Minnesotans, one in four, voted by mail. So it is a tested and a tried system that many, many people already rely on. Um, to Nick's point, many people automatically get their ballot sent to them, so they don't even have to request it in the first place. Um, but we're seeing that fight become partisan in our legislative process um, in, in all layers of government. Um, and I think it's important to take the context of what's happening to voting within the COVID crisis and also attach it to other ways in which folks um, are suppressed from voting. Uh, we've seen over the last four and plus, four plus years hate crimes um, rise in the United States. Um, we've seen increasingly the Voting Rights Act be chipped away at um, recently a provision that allowed or that protected people from being intimidated at the polls expired. And so all of this is happening already to suppress votes. And now you have the COVID crisis, which is just layering on another way in which folks are at risk of having their vote be suppressed. And so what this means for Minnesota is that we as people who care deeply about the access to the ballot that have great protections for people's ability to vote need to make sure that we're fighting and doubling down now um, to ensure that everybody has the protection and the resources they need to vote safely um, because we have an excellent infrastructure here already and um, we have the tools and the ability to make sure that everyone can vote safely. So. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that are happening. Um, additionally, other states are already moving on making sure folks can vote by mail. So 34 states already have vote by mail. Only five of those are universal. But we've seen in states like California and Connecticut and New York, um, governors and other entities take action to already choose to send ballots directly to voters. Um, so what it means here is everything that's happening nationally also impacts us here um, and that what we see in other states can be replicated here and that we can point to their successes and our past successes as examples for why we need to move forward and ensure that this election um, is safe and secure for all people to vote. Great. Can you give us any information about the legislation going, litigation going on about elections in Minnesota? Yeah, and I think I can start that one. Um, so right now there's um, three main cases um, regarding elections in Minnesota and COVID-19. Uh, so the, um, the, the first one that was filed was filed by a, um, a retired employee group. Um, and uh, that one was brought in state court uh, based off of um, alleging violations of Minnesota Constitution and the federal Constitution, um, essentially saying that without some changes to the voting process during the 2020 COVID pandemic, um, that would essentially become a violation of voting rights. Um, the second case was filed by the League of Women Voters of Minnesota, um, as well as our co-plaintiff, uh, Vivian Tannehill, uh, 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 Latimer Tannehill. Um, she, um, uh, uh, we, we, 
essentially uh, we sued in federal court based off the federal constitution. Um, uh, similar issues, uh, believing that there would be a violation of the right to vote and constitutional violations if there weren't some changes. And then there was a third lawsuit uh, brought by NAACP and ACLU uh, in state court uh, based off of Minnesota constitution violations, very similar situation, right to vote, constitutional rights being violated. Um, uh, they're all ongoing. Um, they all are addressing both the primary and the November general election. Um, there's been some news in a couple of them. I don't think there's been any um, settlements or attempted settlements in the third case. In the second case, we did try to come to an agreement, um, but the first case that was filed, there was successful agreement. That was a, a consent decree that was approved by the state court judge, um, and that did two things. The first thing is that um, for the primary election, um, Voters who are already registered to vote um, do not need to seek out a witness to um, witness their ballot when they vote absentee by mail. Usually you need to find another registered Minnesota voter to um, verify, to, 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 to essentially sign saying this is actually the person who is, um, who's trying to vote. Um, the, um, the second piece, uh, so what it did is it, it, it suspended that, it waived it for anyone who's already registered. Um, for people who are trying to do essentially same day registration when they do their, send in their absentee ballot, um, they will need a witness to verify their proof of residence. Um, so um, the key takeaway from there is make sure you're registered and your registration is up to date and make sure, um, and if that's done, then you shouldn't need to find a witness on election day um, or when you do your absentee ballot. Um, the second piece is that uh, usually in Minnesota, your ballot has to be received by your local election office by the end of election day when you're sending it by mail. Um, it's changed now so that it, um, as long as it's postmarked by election day um, and it's received two days after the election, um, then it gets counted. So there's a little more time for voters to return their ballots. Um, Joel, did I miss anything? Okay. I don't think so. Okay, no, great. great. All right, thank you, Nick. Joel, does the governor have the authority <laughs> through an executive order to direct election officials to send ballots to every registered voter? So while these are unprecedented times, and this would be an action that the governor um, hasn't taken before in Minnesota, we believe that that is the way the law is written and are excited to see that there's precedent in other states, like I mentioned, in California and Connecticut and New York, um, to use the power of executive order to ensure that all folks can vote safely. Um, and so we have a little bit of time between now and when that decision would need to be made. And we're really hopeful that the governor will use the power of executive order if the legislature continues to fail to pass that legislation that, like I said, 59% of Minnesotans support. Um, so the legislative avenue has um, fallen short. And so it's incumbent on the governor to take up that responsibility and ensure that everyone is able to get a ballot. And we're really excited to organize folks um, to make sure that um, they have the ability to have their voice heard and that the governor knows that Minnesotans everywhere support making sure that everyone gets a ballot mailed directly to them. Okay. Nick, if a person is going to vote in person, how would they stay safe? Um, yeah, I, uh, the Help America Vote Act funding did provide money to local election officials to ensure that um, they can... Uh, try to find locations that there will be um, social distancing um, and also that they can purchase sanitizing and cleaning agents to make sure that um, facilities are clean. Um, Joelle, do you have anything else to add to sure. that? Yeah, so the safest way to vote this year is going to be by requesting a mail-in ballot and vote by mail. Um, right now, there is widespread excitement about that. We're seeing requests be 20 times higher than they were at this time in the last election in 2018. So I um, wanna really encourage folks who are able to request a vote or request your ballot by mail. 
Um, and that helps for a number of reasons. It helps you stay safe, but it also decreases the total number of people who will need to vote in person um, so that there is a lower risk of transmission at the polling location. But for folks who will be going to a polling location, which we also support, um, wearing a mask, social distancing, bringing your own pen, um, bringing hand sanitizer um, are all great ways to make sure that you're keeping yourself and other voters safe. Um, another way that you can keep yourself and other voters safe is if you are someone who um, is at lower risk for contracting COVID, you are a great candidate to be an election judge. Um, what we know is that older folks and our elders are disproportionately signing up to be election judges. Um, and what we saw in other states who didn't postpone their elections was those were the folks who weren't feeling comfortable showing up to be poll workers um, and that they were feeling that they were not safe to do that. So um, if you are able to and you are low risk, you're a great candidate to fill one of the still vacant poll worker spots in our state. Um, and that's a way that you can also ensure that not just the voters, but also the folks who are making sure our election runs smoothly and safely um, are able to stay safe and lower their risk for, for um, transmitting the virus. Thank you. Um, can we go back to the $14 million that we're getting? Can any of that be used by the local elections offices to address the security and safety issues? Yeah, so actually most of that money has been dis distributed as well. Um, some of that money is distributed to the Secretary of State's office for some select things, but a lot of that money actually gets redistributed to local election offices through local granting to ensure that they can carry out the work. So um, they are already receiving some of that money. They're actually the local county election officials and local counties um, in cities and townships are actually the, the, we're the biggest proponents of getting that funding um, because they're the ones, local governments are the ones who fund our elections. They're one the ones who pay for it. Um, so if they can get some of that funding from the federal government and assistance from the state government, that helps them tremendously. Great. What outreach efforts are, organi are your organizations doing? Jill, do you wanna start? Sure. So at Minnesota Voice, we um, are an organization that wants to promote civic engagement um, in every single way. So one of those key ways that we can do that is voting. Um, we run a number of different programs to expand and protect the right to vote. We run a voting rights table of organizations that come together to strategize on um, lawsuits and legislation that we want to move for permanent institutional structural change. Um, we also do organizing and go out and actually register voters and make sure that they are requesting their vote um, or their ballots in the mail and do turnout work in low turnout communities. Um, so right now we're moving a petition to um, the legislature and to the governor to encourage um, them to pass legislation or executive order to send every voter a ballot in the mail. Um, a common theme of this panel, we would really like every voter to get their ballot in the mail. Um, and we're also pushing folks to sign up to be poll workers. Um, and most importantly, we are working really hard to, to define the context of this election as both one that we need to make sure everyone is able to vote safely and securely, but also one that centers black lives and the folks who have historically been marginalized in our government, um, who have not, not always had the right to vote and making sure that communities um, have that right, that right is protected, and we're making sure every single voice in Minnesota is able to be heard. Um, one specific way that we're doing that is working with the Restore the Vote Coalition. So in Minnesota, there are 63,000 um, people who cannot currently vote because they are either incarcerated or um, have a felony, and that prohibits them from voting even after they are released and have finished their sentence. And so we are encouraging um, the legislature to pass that legislation. Um, there may be other avenues that um, folks are using to try to pass that as well that Nick might be able to speak to, um, but that's a piece of work that we're deeply involved with and have been for a long time. Um, in terms of what the league is doing, so um, obviously our local leagues, um, as they always do, are um, trying to do voter registration and candidate forums, um, though it often has to change now during COVID-19. It's a little more difficult to do that, um, but some of our leagues are trying to transition to um, doing um, es essentially no audience um, candidate forums that are live streamed or recorded for playback um, and still trying to do uh, get people registered to vote through um, 
uh, through social media and encouraging, you know, doing correspondence with other organizations. Um, so, for example, doing special outreach to senior living facilities um, or uh, um, homeless shelters, et cetera, to make sure that people are registered and have access to the ballot. Um, at the state level, um, we've put together a special vote from home campaign that we're pushing out um, so that we walk people through each step of how to vote by mail, um, especially because it can get confusing when there's things changing um, due to the litigation. So even if you voted by mail before, it might look a little bit different this year um, uh, because of the litigation. So we want to keep people up to date on that. Um, our webpage um, on our website, lwvmn.org, um, has that. Um, the website itself is lwvmn.org forward slash vote dash from dash home. Um, in addition to that, we're also doing um, a online voters guide through vote411.org. Um, so this is a, a system where people can go to vote411.org. They can enter their address and it will automatically show them what races are available to them, what races they, they will be able to vote in as a voter, and show them information on those candidates. Um, if you've ever used the sample ballot system um, that the Secretary of State provide, it's very similar to that. Um, but in addition to just showing you the names of those candidates, it will also show you um, information such as their social media links um, and any public contact information for the campaign. And we've also asked the candidates to answer some questions that we think will be helpful to voters um, to understanding uh, what the candidates stand for so that voters can learn more about the candidates. Um, it also will just have a short description of what each um, race does. So if you don't really know what a, uh, you know a city mayor does or you don't know what a city council member does, there'll be a short description to help you understand what that, what that race does. That's great, lots of information that's out there. Joelle, would you like to share with us how people, our viewers can get information on the petition? Sure. Um, our website is minnesotavoice.org and we are Minnesota underscore voice on social media. Um, so you can check out all of those resources to find calls to action um, and more information about the work we're doing. Thank you. What is the latest I can request an absentee ballot? Yeah, I'll take that one. So technically, you can, re can request an absentee ballot any day um, other than Election Day. Um, however, you have to remember that that absentee ballot has to get mailed to you. You have to complete it, and then you have to mail it back. So you want to make sure you're requesting it long before Election Day. We recommend you um, request it as soon as possible. If you haven't done it yet, do it now. Um, and uh, um, but if you haven't requested your absentee ballot within the last week before the election, you may need to go vote in person early or vote on election day because it, there might not be enough time for your ballot to get to you and returned. Still request it mm -hmm. on the off chance it gets to you because it might get to you in time. And don't forget, um, you have two extra days to get that mail back as long as it's postmarked on election day. So that's the good news. Um, so still request it, but if you don't get it in time, um, you may need to vote in person as a backup. So be prepared for that. Um, or be, you know, do it ahead of time. Go ahead and request your absentee ballot as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, a really nice thing we have in Minnesota is if you request your absentee ballot for the primary, you can opt in to always getting an absentee ballot or sent to you. So I just got my ballot in the mail for the primary, and when I did that, I requested to have all my ballots in the future sent to me. Um, and to Nick's point, um, there is a window towards the end where you're at risk of not receiving your ballot, even if you request your ballot and you don't get it by election day, you can go to your polling location and say, hey, I requested a ballot. Could you cancel that? I'd like to vote in person. And they're happy to do that for you. I've done that in past elections um, when I was sort of on that edge of my ballot not getting to me on time, but still wanting to be safe to vote. So the best thing to do is to request it. Um, and you always have backup options if, you, if it doesn't come to you in time. Great, and we would like to point out to our viewers this evening, uh, if you would like to ask questions of our presenters, you can go to the Facebook page for SPNN or League of Women Voters of St. Paul and put your questions in the comment section. We're happy to ask them of the presenters tonight. Another question, on election day, what if there's a shortage of election judges? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a difficult one to answer. We saw that happen in Wisconsin during their presidential primary, and it was not good. Um, polling places couldn't keep up, um, and they had some difficulty um, helping people make sure that they had access to the ballot, which is why it's so important that um, we we encourage people to do absentee voting um, because then there's all that work is more spaced out over weeks rather than having to be done on one day. Um, so if, you know, my biggest piece of advice is if you don't feel, you know, is, is do it um, not only for the sake of your health and safety, but also because it makes the job easier for the people who might be there 13 hours on election day or longer. Um, and of course, as Joelle pointed out, definitely become an election judge if you think that that is something you're able to do. Um, I know that they have lots of options. Um, Joelle, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Great. And it appears that there are a couple of organizations that are promoting voter registration and voting. Center for Voter Information and the Voting Information Center. Could you please comment on them? And specifically, some people are receiving absentee ballot application forms in the mail that are partially filled out. Are there advantages of these direct mailings and should voters trust the CVI mailing forms? Yes, that's a great question. Um, both of those organizations are trusted sources. Um, we work very closely with one of them and encourage folks to respond and take advantage of the fact the absentee ballot request has been sent to you um, and that I believe it includes an envelope so you can just take your form, most of it must is likely already filled out for you, put it into the envelope that they give you and send it right back in. So this is really an organization that is trying to expand access and make sure that folks have the information they need to vote by mail. Um, and so they're, set, they're taking away the step for you and sending it directly to you so that you can then send it out. So we vouch for these organizations and encourage you to um, fill out what they've sent you so that you can get your ballot um, that much more quickly. Great. Uh, going back to the election judges, what's the process to be an election judge and where does someone sign up if they'd like to be one? I can, yeah. Um, the Secretary of State's website has resources about being an elections judge. You will get trained in and will be a judge with your county. Um, so you will likely have more information about what the training looks like on your county's website. But always recommend our Secretary of State's website as a resource for all things voting, all things becoming an election judge. It's a great resource. It's updated really well. So just head to their website. Great. Question from one of our viewers. Do either of you have any concrete talking points for our friends or acquaintances who insist that vote by mail is a setup for fraud? Mm. Uh, do you want to start and I <laughs> sure. can follow? Okay. I can start. Um, what I would say is that Minnesota has been ensuring the security of vote by mail for many cycles. We have done this since the, um, since the legislat legislation passed and the first election it was available. No no excuse, absentee voting was available in 2014. Is that right? 2014 was the first election? So. Yeah, 2014. Um, and so not only have we implemented it successfully and not seen any widespread or really any evidence of fraud whatsoever, um, we've been increasingly um, improving it as we go to make sure it's even more secure. So one in four voters voted by mail um, in 2018, and there were no reports um, of it being something that was for, like, so there were not reports of it being a fraudulent way of voting. So um, that's that's where I would start. Um, I think if you want to go further and talk about how there's a long history of using voter fraud as a dog whistle and as a way to um, suppress the vote, particularly within communities of color, there's a lot of resources out there for that. Um, but just starting from the place of where have we, have we seen any evidence of that happening in Minnesota? We already use this system, might be a helpful starting point, and then digging into the history of why that argument is used um, can really help bring someone along in the understanding of where they might be hearing that from. Yeah, I think that's all good information. And I would just add that um, there are multiple levels of security when you have your ballot requested. Um, and when you, you get your ballot, you're required to put, to, um, put on some, um, um, on your, 
ballot envelope, you do put on some um, personal identifying information that mm -hmm. only you would know. So it's your driver's license number or your social security number. Um, so that's information that, you know, if somebody did somehow manage to get a hold of your ballot, um, they wouldn't know that information. Um, so they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to fill out the the necessary the, the ballot uh, envelope and send the information the ballot back in. Um, on top of that, um, uh, if you submit if somebody submits a ballot, um, that gets recorded. Um, so it's not like somebody can get two ballots and mail two ballots back. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. Um, and the, on the flip side, if you mail your ballot in and it has been counted, you can't then go to your polling place and, and vote again. They, again, it gets recorded. They see it. Um, and, um, you know, you also, um, they keep track of who requests an absentee ballot and who receives an absentee ballot. So um, if, you know, somebody asks for a ballot um, and then, um, or they didn't ask for a ballot and then they mailed in a ballot even though they didn't request one, uh, election officials can see that something went wrong and um, that they need to investigate that. On top of that, um, uh, in Minnesota, if there is any kind of impropriety with elections um, and it looks like somebody may have committed some kind of crime related to elections um, w with voting, um, uh, local election officials are required to investigate and report that. And if there is probable cause, um, a, the prosecutors are required to prosecute um, if there is probable cause. Um, so it's, um, you know, people... The, there are multiple steps throughout the system to ensure that our election system is secure and has integrity. And uh, you know, I think that the, our system in Minnesota comes at it from every angle possible to mm -hmm. ensure that um, the system is secure. Yeah, and I would just add, if folks are concerned about people um, voting who shouldn't, then those same folks should be in support of automatic voter registration, a system that would ensure that folks are registered far in advance and registered properly and that that information is tracked well in advance of the election. And so there are a lot of contradictions in many of the folks who um, say they're concerned about fraud but wouldn't support legislation that could further legitimize and ensure that we have as many people who are eligible to vote voting as possible. Um, so that might also be a helpful way to redirect the conversation um, um, into one that's more about expanding the right to vote um, than using, you know, false information to talk about why we shouldn't uh, make our elections free and um, open to all. Great. So keeping with the absent or the mail-in ballots, um, is Minnesota prepared for absentee balloting to increase by 40, 50, 60 percent? We're sure going to try. <laughs> um, I mean, that was part of the preparation with the HAVA funding um, and why um, you know, local governments are trying to recruit election judges, why organizations like Minnesota Voice are trying to mm -hmm. get people to be election judges. Um, if we um, can get enough election judges um, and people space out their voting um, so that we can get the ballots counted in time, we should be able to handle it, I think. <laughs> yeah. We will be able to handle it. Um, to Nick's point from earlier, it will be even easier to handle if the work for our elections officials is cut down by just sending everyone a ballot immediately. Um, so it takes away about 20% of the work to just send people their ballots directly and cut out the application step. And so if overworking um, these folks who work so hard to uphold our elections is a concern, then one of the best things that we can do is send everyone a ballot directly so that they can spend more time ensuring that in-person voting is safe and COVID conscious um, and less time on paperwork and steps that are unnecessary and that we could cut out completely. Is there any possibility of another special session before the general election? And if so, do you think that there will be any elections or voting bills addressed? Um, so uh, because of COVID-19, the governor has issued um, a, a um, state of emergency for COVID-19. And under Minnesota law, that state of emergency has to be the the governor is required to call the legislature into special session to have the opportunity to essentially challenge or overturn that state of emergency. He is required to do that every 30 days if he extends it. 
Um, so if the governor extends the state of emergency for another 30 days, he will need to call another special session. Um, now, what happens during that special session and whether or not his state of emergency does get overturned by the legislature, I, I don't suspect that the House will want to overturn it um, because I think the House is very concerned about the seriousness of COVID-19. Um, um, and in terms of legislation for elections, I could see there being legislation to try to do um, universal mail voting um, for some legislation and maybe restore the vote as well. Um, some legislation, it's hard to do that close to the election um, because um, you only have so much time for you can make changes. But I think universal mail voting is fairly easy to implement because we already have the system um, essentially in place. It's just less steps um, and restore the vote. Um, again, also pretty easy. You just pass the law and it's ready to implement. Um, there's no, there's no funding or exchange of money or buying, purchasing anything, no printing anything um, new that really needs to be done. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Joelle, do you have any other? Additions? I would just add that almost all legislation that's being discussed in the context of a special session has some connection and intersection with voting. So when we talk about things like an eviction moratorium um, and funding for affordable housing and potentially canceling rent and mortgage payments, we're talking about something that upholds someone's right to vote. Um, being registered in a place, having to re-register, being um, without permanent shelter and needing to find ways to register, um, which we do have in Minnesota. We have really um, accessible ways for folks who are unhoused and unsheltered to vote, but it's more complicated and more cumbersome. Um, thinking about whether or not students will be going back to universities in the fall and whether or not they'll be on campuses um, where voting is very accessible, you can use your student ID and vote very easily, um, may not be where they'll be voting and needing to change up their registration is also something that is intersecting um, with COVID and voting. Folks who are unemployed and losing their insurance and having to weigh, do I feel safe enough risking contracting the virus by voting in person um, if they're not able to vote by mail intersects with voting. And so in addition to all of the legislation that is moving specific to elections, um, we also have a bunch of legislation moving that um, surrounds and is within an ecosystem that supports the right to vote. Um, it's really important that those of us who saw the same, who were um, really upset and in horror at some of the states that allowed voting to move forward without any um, protections for COVID, see things like folks being evicted in mass as a threat to their voting right, um, as a threat to another essential human right. Um, so I would just add that really everything that we're talking about with COVID does have an intersection with the election and someone's ability to vote, um, whether it's explicitly taking away their right to vote or chipping away or making it more difficult, it's still suppressing the vote and it's still making it more difficult for people to have their voice heard in the election. That's a really good point. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. All right, and along those lines, um, with the special needs uh, uh, individuals in the state of Minnesota, are there any concerns with a mail-in ballot for them? Um, so if you're talking about like voters who have developmental disabilities, um, or are you talking about um, with special health needs, or do you know? I mean, I, I, I think for most voters, I mean, the system is pretty secure. Um, if you need assistance voting, um, you can have anyone assist you in filling out your ballot, except an agent of your employer or an agent of your union. Um, but anyone else can help you. Um, they do not have to be a registered voter. They do not have to be a citizen. They do not have to be 18. Um, anyone can help you fill out your ballot, essentially. And if you don't have someone um, you know, if you're going in person to vote and you don't have someone who can help you, you can always ask the election judges to help you as well. Um, can you give an estimation on how long it takes to get my absentee ballot after they've submitted their form? Mm. I have a first person example. I just got my absentee ballot in the mail today. Um, I requested it a couple weeks ago, but I do know that because I requested it before the first day it was sent out, which was June 26th, this last Friday, I mean, it landed today. So I assume it was prepped on the Friday and then took maybe two days to come in the mail. So that was my experience. I got it today and I'm returning it in the mail tomorrow. 
Um, I think it can vary by location based off of how many election judges they have working. Um, so I can't give a definitive answer on that um, other than request as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, do we know if there will be early in-person voting for the general election? Barring any massive disastrous changes, there should be early in-person voting. Um, Yes. <laughs> yeah. I believe all counties are required to have some form of in-person absentee voting. Yeah. It is up to some cities and some counties to determine how much they want to go beyond what is in the law. Um, but yeah, to Nick's point, unless there's some intervention that right. keeps that from happening, um, it's moving ahead as, as planned. Great. How do people who are homeless register to vote and how do they vote? Um, so there's a couple different ways. Um, so for people, if they are living, you know, sleeping regularly at a, a, at a homeless shelter, um, they can register to vote there. Um, for some folks who are more mobile, um, or, or maybe they don't sleep in a physical building, maybe they sleep on a park bench, they can actually use the paper registration form and write a description of where they sleep and they'll be registered to vote there because you still have the right to vote where you live, even if the, where you live is not a traditional house. Mm -hmm. um, so Minnesota, you just have to, they would be able to register on a paper form by writing the description. So they would write something like, you know, bench at such and such park and then put like the city in zip code and that would register them to vote. Um, what that means is they would get challenged when they go to vote. Um, they wouldn't be able to receive a mail vote, a mail ballot because there wouldn't be an address to send the mail ballot to, but they would be able to vote early or in, per, uh, in person or on election day. And then when they went to vote, they would be challenged because they wouldn't be able to receive what's called a postal verification card. It's just a card that, um, it's one of the multiple checks for, for integrity of our elections um, uh, that for most voters, they have a traditional address. And so that verifies that it's a traditional address and they receive mail there. Um, for someone who, who doesn't have a, a traditional address, um, they would receive a challenge. They would just sign a statement under the penalty of law like that says, yes, I'm the person I say I am. Yes, I live there. Um, and then they would vote just like normal. Um, and if they um, don't register ahead of time, they can also um, have a, um, a person vouch for them when they go vote as well. So someone who knows that they live there, um, they, another re registered voter can vouch and say, yep, that person lives there. I can, uh, I can, I can verify that they live, um, they can live there, so. Great. Do you think that there is sufficient funding that's been approved to conduct the elections? Um, I would say we are doing okay, but my philosophy is that you could always put more money into elections to make it easier and more efficient. Um, and it always appears, for some reason, it always tends to be difficult the last few years to get that funding. Um, the federal government, you know, they've approved that funding and sent it to Minnesota. And for whatever reason, there has been a resistance, um, particularly in the Senate, of allowing that money to come to local election officials. Um, so I, I'm not really, it's puzzling to me because if we want our elections to be run well and to, and to be secure, you would think that we want to make sure that they, local election officials have that funding to do that. Um, so my, my philosophy is always, you know, I think there's always ways that we could be improving our system um, and funding better systems. Um, Joelle mentioned automatic voter registration. I think that's a great example, is that that will require some initial, um, you know, some initial um, funding to implement the system. But for the most part, actually over time, automatic voter registration would save money um, because it would reduce the amount of administrative overhead. Joelle? Just adding that for most local counties that are running their elections, um, in work that I've done in student organizing, when we've asked for an expansion of early voting days or more locations, the biggest barrier is funding. Um, and that's not always because there isn't funding available. Sometimes, in the case of Minnesota, it's because funding that is available still needs to be approved by the state. So in Minnesota, the Help, Every, uh, Help America Vote 
resources from the federal government that Nick has been mentioning. Um, most states get that automatically, but in Minnesota, the legislature has to approve the um, re receiving those funds and distributing them out. So even if the money is available and allocated to us, partisan politics can get in the way of those resources landing with counties who need it, who would be able to expand voting and make um, it more accessible to more people. Um, so. Uh, um, while folks are thinking about increased resources, which is super important, always be asking for more resources for voting. Um, also know that you may have a legislator that is standing in the way of resources that are already here being allocated um, efficiently out into our state to make sure that more people can be voting. Can I request an absentee ballot, not fill it out, and decide to vote in person? Yes, you would go and you would tell the elections um, judges and workers that you did that and then they would um, cancel that ballot and then issue you a new one. I've done it before. Great. Can you share a bit more about how the legislative session and the special session shifted because of COVID-19 and the murder of George Floyd and especially as it's related to voting and elections? Yeah, um, I mean, I honestly can barely even remember the beginning of session before COVID. Um, it's felt like decades. Um, so I wish I could tell you more about what um, the, the, the caucuses were planning at that time. Um, but what happened is once COVID became a priority, um, almost immediately anything that wasn't COVID related got shut down. Um, if it wasn't directly about um, addressing the pandemic, it got shut down. Um, once and then, of course, the legislature also had to adjourn temporarily because of COVID until they could figure out a safe way to gather, a safe way to vote, a safe way to meet in committee um, electronically. So um, that was a huge change that I don't think the legislature was prepared for. Anyone was prepared for, really. And that's not to blame them. I don't think, you know, I, I can't expect that anyone would be um, prepared for a once in a hundred year pandemic at the state legislative level. You know, usually they're not thinking about how to you know, if there was a hundred year pandemic, you know, what would we do? Um, but they were able to kind of scramble and get that figured out. Um, then the, that ended, um, and then the death of George Floyd was very traumatic. And that on top of uh, the pandemic also created some problems with trying to figure out um, how do we address that crisis as well on top of what's going on. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, I think there's some very strongly differing opinions on how to address um, the circumstances uh, relating the tragedy of George Floyd's death. Um, and that created some complications in terms of what solutions would be proposed and agreed to. Um, I know that um, the House, um, you know, uh, we've talked a little bit about restore of the vote and restoration of voting rights. That's one solution that was proposed um, because it disproportionately affects people of color, especially um, black, black folks in Minnesota. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not directly tied to George Floyd and his death, but it is tied to the circumstances around his death and um, the issues, um, the, you know, the systemic racism that's in our, our system of governance and how does that affect um, what happened to George Floyd? Um, you know, if maybe if our, yeah, yeah. Joelle, do you have anything to add? I would add that for a legislature that is comparatively and historically pretty open and transparent um, and, you know, ranks highly in comparisons to other states around transparency, watching COVID hit our special session changed the culture of our legislature in a way that I don't know if we fully like grasped, grasped yet. Um, I'm so used to seeing hundreds or thousands of people showing up in the rotunda or at committee hearings. And to see that um, leave the legislature, I think really impacted what was able to get done get done this session. Um, and it also made it difficult for people to track what their elected officials were doing because a lot of conversations happened um, behind closed doors or privately um, due to both the expediency of needing to get things done, but also because you could, because you didn't have to host things in a public open forum and there wasn't an expectation of that. So I think that's one 
thing and symptom of what we're seeing and and something that could play out in the election. Um, I also want to name that the same language that's being used to talk about voter fraud is the same language that's used to cast the protests and demonstrations that have been happening in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and all across our state, not just Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, as rioting and as violent. And um, using similarly racialized language, dog whistles that are deeply rooted in white supremacy. And so while I don't, while I can't make a clear connection between um, how the legislature has handled um, legislation around COVID and George Floyd, um, because you know there are a lot of differences. I do think one thing that ties them together is how the folks who are standing in opposition to progress and to the expansion of civil rights um, are using language that's rooted in the same system. Great, thanks. This is a big year. Lots of things on the ballot and also the census. Are there concerns about completion of the census and voter participation? Hmm. I get into that. Do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, well, last I checked, and maybe we're not anymore, but last I checked, our self-reporting rate was really high. We were leading the nation. So I feel really good about that. Um, I think that COVID absolutely will have an impact. So many of the programs that were focused on getting people to um, fill out the census were door-to-door, -door, canvas based programs that um, it was no longer safe to do. So I do have some concerns about everyone being counted and have really admired the way that organizations have um, risen to the occasion to find other creative ways. And clearly, um, Minnesotans are still filling out their census at record levels, and we're seeing lower response rates or um, a gap in the response rates between white Minnesotans and non-white Minnesotans. So that's something that as we wrap up tonight and talk about calls to action, one really meaningful thing that folks can do is now that there are more opportunities to plug back in and as we approach census deadline, um, is really plugging into organizations that are working to make sure that communities of color in particular are ca getting counted um, so that we don't um, miss Cat the, miss the the count and the resources that come into communities when they are counted. I mean, we we do have some benefit because some of the census deadlines are being pushed back um, theoretically, and so there will be more time to fill out your census. So usually, um, they they try to have people do self responses completed in the spring of 2020, um, but. Um, they self responses are encouraged throughout. I think even as far as August at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so they've pushed back some of this because of COVID. Um, but I think we are struggling um, to keep up with where we need to be. Um, even though Minnesota does have the highest response rate in the nation, and that's great, we can brag about it. It's also not good enough. I don't want perfect to be the enemy of good, but we still need to you know, do better, um, especially as Joelle was mentioning, lots of communities that um, are already marginalized and underrepresented. We need to make sure that we're helping them complete their census forms um, so that they can get um, counted. Um, because that also allows them to be fairly represented when there's redistricting um, in 2022. Right, and about the redistricting, would you like to talk about that briefly in terms of Okay. Yeah, I can talk about that. So um, I, basically, after we do the census, when we've counted every person in the nation and we've tried to, we also have to then do redistricting. Um, every state has to do redistricting. That's the process by which we, we redraw our voting maps. Um, our voting maps are um, essentially, you know, the district that your legislator, your senator, your um, U.S. congressperson represent the geographic area. And that has to be withdrawn to um, keep districts approximately equal in population um, based off of population changes over the last 10 years. Some communities grow, some communities shrink, um, but there are changes that need to be accounted for. We've seen in other states especially um, that redistricting has been a method used to um, disenfranchise people. Um, racial gerrymandering was a huge problem. Um, the Voting Rights Act tried to, you know, uh, solve some of that problem, most of it. Um, unfortunately, as Joelle was saying, the Voting Rights Act has been chipped away um, by the Supreme Court um, over the last several years, which is unfortunate. Um, but 
Um, people are also very concerned about partisan gerrymandering. So um, that's something that the league is already thinking about. We already know that that's coming. We have a, um, a the national campaign, People Powered Fair Maps, to try to fight gerrymandering in every every single state. Um, and at the state level, we are working with partners and um, trying to find systems to create a you know a, a system of People Powered Fair Maps here in Minnesota. Um, unfortunately, for the ever since we've had to do redistricting, essentially a Basically, every decade, a court has had to do it because the legislature has failed to do its job um, or the governor has vetoed the maps and the legislature has not drawn new ones. So we're trying to avoid that um, this next cycle. We're trying to get a system in place where maps can be drawn and approved and voted on and they're fair and they're accurately representative of Minnesotans. Is there a chance that Minnesota might lose one representative? That is a possibility. Um, so in addition to redistricting, they also um, uh, change the number of representatives you get um, in Congress and the number of electoral votes you get, uh, votes you get in the Electoral College because those are dependent on population size as well. Minnesota last cycle, um, at last census squeaked by with literally the last seat possible, the last, um, the last seat. Um, so we are fighting very hard to keep our seat um, this year, which is why it's so important to get out the count. Um, in a really twisted way, um, we might keep our seat, possibly because of the severe undercount in other states like Texas, because there's been a severe undercount um, because of COVID and because of, um, frankly, um, attempts to scare away people from filling out their census forms. Um, there might be really severe undercounts in states like Texas, which means we might have a better chance of keeping our seat, um, which I suppose is nice in the sense that we get to keep a seat, but also very unfortunate that we're not accurate, accurately representing every person in, in the nation. Can you say anything to about the vote by mail legislation that's at the federal level? I do know that um, Senator Klobuchar has introduced some legislation um, about this. I um, and I know that there has been legislation in the House as well. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. Senate um, Senator McConnell has no interest in that legislation. So um, you got to have both chambers to pass it. All right. Um, thinking about the Minnesota legislation, legislature, uh, which bill has the best chance to pass and why? Um, that's a difficult question because, um, you know, as, as Joelle and I have talked about today, there's been some disagreements on between the chambers on what um, potential responses to COVID are. Um, I will say, you know, you know, Joelle pointed out that 59% of Minnesotans do want universal mail voting for the COVID um, pandemic. And I will say that Restore the Vote also is very popular um, and has support uh, in a bipartisan manner um, uh, in both legislative chambers, the Senate and the House. And I, I think that, you know, frankly, I don't see a good reason why they shouldn't pass. Um, you know, I obviously want to engage with people and have conversations about their concerns, but I, you know, they're both good legislation that should pass. Joelle, did you want to? No. <laughs> um, well, I'll just say that what legislators are willing to take up in an election year is directly tied to how many folks they're hearing from, who they feel are risking their reelection or ensuring their reelection. Um, and so I encourage and we encourage folks to um, continue, especially if in, you're in a seat um, that has very close elections, to continue to reach out um, to your elected officials because, as Nick mentioned, um, they're, gonna, they're going to continue to come back to special session so long as the governor um, um, continues to have executive orders for the pandemic um, and that it... Um, you know, we've seen folks move on issues in Minnesota state history even recently, um, spe spe specifically around gay marriage and um, driver's license for immigrants and undocumented folks. We have seen people move and do away with partisan politics and stand on the side of an issue that maybe their caucus wasn't supportive of. And so um, 
while we can't speak to what bill is most likely to get passed, what I would say is the one that the most amount of people are mobilizing around. Great, thank you. So thinking about registering to vote, one of the things that would typically be happening right now would be uh, get out the vote opportunities. Given social distancing and other issues related to COVID-19, we're not actually doing that right now. Can you give us some tools and some ideas for all of us that we could use to get people excited about and registering to vote? Um, I can start. I think, you know, obviously social media is a big one. Um, uh, you know, using social media to to post to your friends and can contact your friends, giving them, giving them information like our um, our vote from home campaign information and the vote411.org um, information. Um, but not only your friends, but also posting to your Facebook groups as well, so people you're not as well connected with. Um, uh, you know, uh, Twitter, email. If you have a book group that's still meeting by Zoom um, or a church group that's still meeting by Zoom, definitely um, maybe that's an opportunity to talk to folks too. Um, I know that lots of organizations also do phone banking. Um, it's not something that the State League has done um, recently for Get Out the Vote, um, but I know that lots of organizations do phone banking. Um, Joelle? Um, yeah, so there are organizations that are safely getting back in the field to do canvassing with social distancing in mind and protective gear. Um, just a couple weekends ago, we were out for Juneteenth canvassing um, uh, community resource hubs and demonstrations to get folks to vote or get folks registered. So there are some opportunities. Folks are starting to get back in the field, figuring out how to do that safely. Um, but there's also ways, in addition to social media, lots of organizations are doing text campaigns um, and phone banking. And we know that one of the most effective ways to get folks to vote is reaching out to your personal networks. Um, some organizations use tools that make it a lot easier to look through your lists of friends on Facebook or other social media and find out who's not registered. Um, and we also know that text campaigns, especially ones that um, build up a relationship over time and um, reach out to folks consistently from trusted messengers is also a way that folks get registered. And so plugging in with an organization um, that has a plan to reach out to folks now and then closer to the election is a really great way to ensure people will get out and vote. Um, but overall, one of the most effective ways is for you to share why you're voting. Um, right now, voting is one of many tactics that we have in our civic engagement toolbox. Um, lots of folks using direct action, protest, um, and petitions to great effect, and we need to use all of those, but we also need to vote, and so being able to say, I'm doing all these other things to move social change and voting is another tool, whether it be for harm reduction, whether it be for voting with your values, whether it be by ensuring um, that someone who has voted poorly in the, fa in the past no longer holds that power, um, there are a lot of ways to use the lever that is voting. And so that's what we're out here doing is trying to encourage folks to use all of the available tools, recognizing that voting is still one of the most powerful, um, particularly in changing the material conditions that communities are living in. Great, thank you. So schools are not an option for voting. There will be other locations. Do you have information on what those might be? And how will the locations and the hours for early voting be communicated to citizens in Minnesota? So to be clear, there may still be polling places at schools. It's just that it can only be used as a last resort. Um, but um, I. Early voting um, are usually general business hours, um, whatever that is for your local county um, or local um, city. Um, usually it's the general business hours of wherever your local election office is located. Um, some um, cities and counties um, choose to expand on that and do even longer, um, and that's great. Um, what you'll need to do if you um, want to make sure that they're open when you're going to go is to call your local election office. Um, if you need that information, that's available on the Secretary of State's website. Um, a link to a list of your local election office's phone numbers is also available at a link on our Vote From Home page um, way down at the bottom. Um, it says if you need to call your local election office, it gives you a link and it lists every election office in every county and um, all 87 of them, so. 
Um, do you know the Secretary of State's website? Um, there's the, more, the easiest if you're a voter is just mnvotes, M-N-V-O-T-E-S dot org. Perfect. Um, calls to action. Would each of you like to take a moment and talk about some calls to actions for the viewers today? Sure. Um, I would say some of the most important things that you can do to plug in. First, fill out your census, register yourself to vote, register your family to vote, get your, get your absentee ballot request in are ways that you and your close family and your close friends can make a big difference. Ways that you can make an even broader difference are one, by signing our petition um, to encourage a legislature and or the governor to send ballots to every single person that's on our website at minnesotavoice.org. Um, the second thing that we wanna encourage everyone to do is reach out to your elected officials and encourage them when they do come back for special session um, to pass legislation to make sure that um, voting is protected and expanded. Um, and the third thing we want to highlight is reminding folks that um, even though we're in a state that does have excellent access to the ballot and we have really high voter turnout, that there are still people who are barred from voting in our state. Um, and to encourage everyone to sign petitions and also reach out to your elected officials, um, pushing them to restore the vote to folks who um, don't have it and restore felon voting rights. Um, so those are our big three right now. Um, I think from us, a yes to all those things. The only additions I would make is, um, uh, you know, uh, send our vote from home campaign information to folks if they are um, looking for information on how to vote from home and do absentee voting. Um, and also um, connect people with vote411.org, especially the information on candidates, um, because that's actually one of the, what research has shown that's actually one of the one of the biggest reasons people don't vote is they feel like they don't know enough about the candidates. So um, that's why we're doing a big push on Vote 411 so that folks can learn about the candidates. That's excellent. So that was vote411.org? Yep. Perfect. Um, how do felons find out if they're eligible to vote? So if they have completed their sentence um, or off paper, is, is the casual way of saying it. Um, so what that means is they need to be done not only with any incarceration, but also with any probation, parole, or supervised release. Um, that's where it can get dicey for some folks because it can be confusing to know whether or not you're actually off paper. Because um, in some places, especially in greater Minnesota, people can be on probation for literally 20 years. Um, and so um, our advice is if you have a parole officer to talk to your parole officer and confirm, um, yes, you're off paper. Um, if you have a lawyer still, talk to your lawyer. Um, uh, otherwise, um, I would say um, your local elections office might have additional advice on figuring out whether or not you're off paper. Um, but I would say start with, um, if you have a parole officer of some kind, start with them. If you have a lawyer, start with them and then move to um, um, any other uh, like the local election office for additional advice if you're not sure. As we watch the current litigation related to voting and COVID-19, can you remind us again how the decisions apply to both the primary and general elections? Yeah, so, so far, the only thing that has been affected is the primary election. No decisions have been made yet about the general election in November. The litigation will continue and there will be some kind of resolution in the in the next few months on that, um, but we have to wait for that litigation to play out to know what what the result will be. That's great. Would each of you like to take a moment to share some final thoughts? Um, it's a big election year. Um, the ballot's going to include president, U.S. senator, U.S. Congress, Minnesota Senate, Minnesota House, um, possibly county commissioner possibly mayor, possibly city council, possibly school board. Um, so it's a very big year. And that's all just for the primary. Um, there may be even more offices for the general. Um, so, um, and soil and water board, if you are interested in voting for that race um, for some folks. So it's a very big election year with a very big ballot. Um, it's not the year to miss it. I know it's harder this year because of the pandemic and it might feel very overwhelming because of current events and because there's so much on the ballot, but really, you know, if you need help figuring out how to learn about candidates or how to 
um, vote. Um, you know, folks like Minnesota Voice, folks like the League, we're happy to help you um, get access to the ballot. So I would wrap up by saying two things. First, we want to encourage everyone to vote and, and protest, and petition, and lobby, and engage in direct action. Um, take all of the tools in the toolbox and use every single one of them because voting alone will not and cannot change all of the conditions that oppressed people are living in. Um, and on that point, second, I would like to remind folks that, again, while we're in a state that does such amazing work to ensure that voting is accessible and easy, there are still so many people who don't have easy access to voting, and the pandemic is going to further um, threaten the ability for them to have their voice heard. Um, and so make sure that even though your right to vote is protected, you're thinking about all of the folks whose vote is not protected um, or guaranteed and remember that none of us none of our votes matter until all of our votes matter and so for folks who are um, formerly incarcerated for folks who are homeless or highly mobile um, or for folks who don't have access to the information um, that they need to vote that those are all people that we need to be expanding um, the right to and to be making sure that our programs are funded and reaching all of those populations um, so that all of our voices are heard in our government. Great. Thank you both very much for coming here this evening. We appreciate this discussion and the, uh, the answers that you gave to our questions. Um, want to do one last plug for vote411.org. Yes, uh, there will be a sample ballot uh, the uh, vote411.org as well as information as listed just a moment ago. And now I'd like to turn it over to Claudia Dieter. Claudia. Thanks, Beatrice. On behalf of the League of Women Voters St. Paul, I would like to thank you again for taking the time to join us this evening. We hope that you found the program to be interesting and that it provided you with some new information. We would also like to thank Nick and Joelle, and of course, SPNN, especially Steve Brunsberg, who has been very patient with guiding us through this new world. Additionally, we'd like to again express our specific appreciation to the community TV stations in the Twin Cities for airing this program. And personally, I would like to thank the program committee members who worked to make this happen. I invite you to check out our website, lwvsp.org, and our Facebook page, as well as the sites for both the Minnesota League and Minnesota Voice. This program was recorded. Replay dates on SPNN will be posted on both our website and Facebook page, as will a link to watch the program on YouTube. The League of Women Voters St. Paul intends to continue to provide information to the community. We will continue to explore ways to deliver the information and we will learn along the way. The League has been in the community of St. Paul for 100 years. We intend to stay around for a little bit longer. We invite you to become a member. Thank you and good night.